Welcome to the MIT Leadership Center video series. Today we have Stan McChrystal with us. Welcome, Stan. Thanks. Stan has been in the military for 34 plus years and is now working intensively in the civilian world trying to make a difference there as well. Look forward to visiting with you a little bit about leadership and your life. Um, so let's begin. As you look back on the leadership work that you've done over the years and who you are as a leader, what are one of the two of the most powerful shaping experiences you've had that have impacted your work as a leader? Can you think of one or two that made a difference? Sure. I, I think we all have inflection points in our mm -hmm. evolution as a leader. Uh, I think lessons can come before and after, but you may not be ready to hear them. Mm. When I was a young captain, I commanded a mechanized infantry company, about 120 mm. soldiers. And I had a battalion commander came in, a new battalion commander came in, and he was named Tom Graney, and he was a phenomenal leader, but he was very non-standard. He, he had a little bit of a paunch, he smoked heavily, <laughs> he liked to drink now and again, and so he was sort of the opposite of some of the ramrod-like leadership traits that you talk, mm -hmm. except he was frighteningly competent and he cared deeply. And so I learned that those external things that sometimes leaders, how they dress, how they act, may have some value, but they're not the core of what's important. And that, that leader uh, once joked with the battalion, he said uh, he didn't like to do physical training too much. He says, I want to know that every soldier's in physical training formation at 6.30 tomorrow morning. Because when I roll over and go back to sleep, I want to know where you are. Now, it was a joke, but it was his way of connecting with us, but also reminding us that certain things are important. And he was this phenomenal leader without having to paint himself in the stereotypical cloak of leadership. He was mm. so good at making the unit better that he didn't have to take on out, outside trappings. You know, that, that's in interesting to me because in the corporate world, and I think it may be the same in your world from the realtor experience, the systems rarely, truly reinforce the development of that kind of leader, the development th th that you're paying attention to okay. building leadership capacity. It can often become all about me and my progression in my career and that sort of a thing. It sounds like he was one of those guys. He was one of those people that was more focused on developing you than, than himself, more focused on making the organization work than he was mm. in projecting a personal image. Mm. And I think you're right, because if you think about many organizations, mm -hmm. your height, your charisma, mm -hmm. your ability to articulate things becomes maybe more important than the actual performance of the organization that you're there to lead. Mm -hmm. And so if we did sort of a blind test mm -hmm. and looked at the performance of units but couldn't see the leaders, mm -hmm. couldn't be affected by their ability to talk or act smoothly mm -hmm. a certain way, mm -hmm. I think sometimes we'd find that people who don't fit the mold that we expect may produce better outcomes. Mm. Uh, it would be an interesting set of studies. How, how do you see through that? I talked to an investor, a private equity investor once. I said, how do you select firms that you think might be good mm. to invest in? And he said, well, I don't go meet with a CEO. Mm. And I said, why? He says, because most CEOs have developed the skills to project well and to, to paint a good picture. He says, I go look at certain factors, certain economic factors, and then I try to go into the company and see how people interact. Mm. I think it's very true. You can go to an organization in any kind, mm. and you can be sort of mesmerized by their ability to project a story. Mm -hmm. But if you peel beneath the layers and you ask individuals below how mm -hmm. they feel, mm -hmm. if you look at just whatever metrics are appropriate for that organization, how they produce, I think often you get a much more real sense of it. But it's hard to break through. Mm -hmm. If you go to visit a company or an organization, typically they want to control your time and give you a, a very staged briefing and whatnot because mm -hmm. they have a story they want to tell. Mm -hmm. And that's, there's nothing evil about that, but it's typically not the whole story. So as a general, you know, everything's getting polished and cleaned and shaped and presented and, you know, you wander in a space when you're in the military and, and they're ready for you. 
How do you avoid getting tricked by the surface? It's a real challenge because with no evil intent, they will yeah. schedule your visit to the moment so that you will walk here, get this briefing, walk there. And if you break that schedule, there are some negatives. People mm. will have prepared and then you will change it and therefore you'll cause a lot of people who have mm. done a lot of work for nothing. So you can be very thoughtless if you do that. Mm. What I found is you need to project up front your expectations for the visit. Mm. You need to tell the people beforehand, this is what I don't want and this is what I would like. Mm -hmm. And you have to set up venues that allow you to talk to groups of people at lower levels. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can't just barge in and throw out what they've done. You've got to create that uh, environment to do it. Mm -hmm. And then you've got to use surrogates as well. Mm -hmm. When you go visit, you've got to understand that you're a single person with the limits of your senses. Mm -hmm. You've got to have people in whom you trust that can also visit either at other times or while you are and ask different questions and, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and talk to people on the periphery. Uh, it's not trying to deceive anyone, it's trying to fully understand. Uh, a complex organization deserves more than a two-dimensional snapshot mm -hmm. to try to form a judgment from. Mm -hmm. That two-dimensional snapshot doesn't portray the full edge of what's going on. Right. And and part of the deepest leadership work, it seems like, is, is probing with intentionality what we don't know we don't know. It's that unknown unknown space that in a military world can, can really create disasters, but in a private personal world it can do the same thing. Are there things, you know, beyond what you just described, which is partly, you know, getting, getting informants in one sense, people in different parts of the system, um, going out of your way to break up too rigid of a schedule when you're seeing things. Anything else you do that, that prepares you right. to, to uncover those unknowns? It's first developing the ability to understand what you don't know. Yeah. The second is developing those questions that you would need to know. In the military, we call them priority informa information requirements, or PIR. <laughs> and you say, these are the items of information I need to know. Mm -hmm. And then from that, you develop a collection plan. Mm -hmm. How am I going to know that? Mm -hmm. What indicators or what pieces of information and where do I have to have them in and what time mm -hmm. to fill that? Mm -hmm. And the leader's got to give a thought because if the leader is passive, mm -hmm. then the leader knows what people have decided to shove their way. And because of this flood of information now, it's very easy to feel passive. Mm -hmm. You know, you put your phone mm -hmm. so that you get certain news alerts, et cetera, mm -hmm. and you are in the receive mode mm -hmm. and, and you haven't crafted mm -hmm. the questions or mm -hmm. the hooks to pull what you really need. Mm -hmm.